Welcome to the Ralph Planetarium. Glad to see so many people here tonight. We're going to get started in about two minutes, and I do want to ask that you silence your cell phones, please. This is going to be videotaped for those who could not make it tonight and for students who are in class tonight. Or potato. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Bullet Lecture. I'm super pumped to see everybody here. Uh, and I also know that I am not the main event, so I'll keep this very, very short. Um, I'm Ben Holverda. This is our speaker, uh, Karen Janney, and this is all thanks to uh, Laurie Watkins and his generous donation for the, uh, the Bullet Lecture series. And so we have one more thing before we get into it, which is the uh, prize, um, uh, the prizes for the Bullet Prize and the Bullet Scholarship. So, Laurie, do you want to come up here and, uh, and hand them out? Um, so we have uh, Chris Henry, Laurie Porter, and Camilla Nasser. Could you come up here, please? Um, So we'll start with the, the, the best prize. Uh, the best prize was a tough one this year because both Laurie and Camilla wrote a fantastic paper this year uh, on completely different subjects. So uh, we decided to split it. And so Laurie and uh, Kami, uh, congratulations on your prize. And The name is oh. <clears throat> not on the outside. <laughs> yes, okay. This is Candy's. That's Lori's. So. And the uh, Bullet Scholarship goes to Chris Henry, a uh, U.S. Army veteran, and uh, yes, you are a U.S. Army veteran. <clears throat> okay, and a U of L student at, uh, at the Physics Department. So, uh, congratulations to you all three. do it in the replay. Um, so now without any further ado, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce Karen Jani with his uh, a talk of listening to the dark universe. Uh, I don't work in black holes, and every time I give a talk at a school, I get asked to black black holes. Now you get the actual expert. I am thrilled to hear what he's going to say. So here we go. Can you all hear me well? Okay, perfect. Well, it is my absolute honor to be here at the University of Louisville and to be giving this here some bullet lecture. I am very, very um, thankful to the Marshall Fund, the University 
University, the Planetarium, and especially the SPS for inviting me here. What I'm going to speak about today has been the focus of at least my professional journey for about the last 15 years. And uh, we are now at a sort of a particular time in the history of science when we can see a new way that we as human civilization interact with the universe. That has, hasn't happened in years of biological evolution so far. And what I hope that in this sort of uh, brief next 30, 40 minutes, I give you a sense of why this is such a watershed moment. But also more importantly, I see a lot of young students here, it's like why this particular thing that I'm going to describe is essentially the future of not only my field, not only future of astronomy, but really how future of human civilization uh, dictates. So going directly to this thing of the universe. Now this is, as of today, the greatest image ever taken by humankind. This is the picture of the ultra deep field by the James Webb Space Telescope. It was released a couple of weeks ago by President uh, Biden. Uh, in this image, you can see it's essentially a time travel, right? You can see the galaxy, the first galaxies that were born in the universe. You can also see some of the earliest galaxies that are there. Everything that we know about how we exist, why we are here on this planet Earth, the answer lies somewhere within this picture. Every elemental composition is there within this picture. I think it's absolutely phenomenal by itself. However, we, there is still a humbling aspect of this image. Uh, every bright thing that we see in that image comes out of most likely stars or galaxies or the dust around the stars. Now, in the universe, as we understand, there are only about 5% of ordinary matter that has the capacity to create what we call light. And by light, I mean in its broadest definition, it can, it can be X-ray, it can be UV rays, it can be infrared, it can be visible light, whatever it is. There is only actually 5%, it's actually even less than 5%, it's only about a percentage matter energy in the entire universe that can create light. About 30% of the universe is dictated by what we call dark matter. We don't know what it is made up of, but we do know in this very picture, you can see that some of these galaxies don't just look like pancake, but they look like this distorted spaghetti, so to speak. And the reason that happens is because uh, the light is being reflected by an unknown source there, which we call dark matter. Now that itself is very troubling because you know we as human beings like to think that we understand the universe we live in. But the matter, the very matter itself, uh, we don't know what the majority of the thing that creates in the universe. In fact, what we say is galaxy, what we look at ourselves, you can think of them only as a topping on the cake. And the rest of the what makes the cake is still remains widely unknown. Now, this was already somewhere we had established in the late uh, 19th, uh, late, later part of the 20th century. And then another phenomenon happened to be observed uh, by astronomers, which is called dark energy. That there is a form of energy in the universe that is consciously ripping things apart. And that alone accounts for almost 70% of the entire energy that is there in the universe. As of now, we don't know what it is. We have some rough ideas that what the dark energy can be made up of. But we don't have the same way of understanding dark energy and dark matter, the way we have understanding of what this particular picture is trying to tell us. So one can argue then, is like how do we even know that something like this exists if we don't have a mathematical framework to explain? But this particular number, we know up to second digits, like second significant digits, that we know how much dark matter is in the universe. We know how much dark energy is in the universe with the same certainty that we know that biological evolution has occurred on planet Earth for millions of years, right? So there is no doubt about these numbers. But we won't be able to, just by measuring light, we'll be able to solve this mystery. Now, I'm gonna take sort of a brief here from my founding question, you know, what is the purpose of ourselves in the universe and why, why 
own journey begins in a part of India in a relatively small town. And I have to quote Einstein's relativity here because the relatively small town of India is still pretty big in the context of the United States. Uh, I grew up in this particular part of India, which is the Red Star. This is how my city looked uh, before we got the independence from the British in 1947. Uh, the most famous person who grew up in the same region where I'm from is, uh, is Mahatma Gandhi. He was one of the freedom fighters, and most of my family had been sort of involved with this uh, freedom struggle as well. There was nothing around me growing up asking why, you know, sort of these grand questions of the universe, let alone I had never seen the universe, even the moon through a telescope until I came to college. But there was something that always stuck to me as a sort of question that I still keep it as a soul of how I do astronomy is what is our purpose in the universe? And very accidentally, when I had just finished high school, I discovered a book written by Professor Stephen Hawking, who was at Cambridge. And I found a secondhand copy of the book from a street vendor. And post reading that, I was absolutely convinced that if there's anything in my lifetime that I want to really study, it is black holes. And it had like had a deep uh, sort of um, curiosity in me. But it also made my questions a little more uh, structured. The right question is not maybe what is our purpose in this universe, but to rather ask what are the fundamental rules of our universe? You know, what are the particular things that make dark energy, what makes dark matter? Why are stars and galaxies the way it is? What are these certain fundamental rules that operate across the universe? And uh, a few years after reading the book, I was at the institute with uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. It's one of the pictures that I have the courtesy of meeting him. I met him for lunch, actually. And I was able to tell him how much impact his one book has had in uh, communities much beyond that had ever had an access to a physics lecture like this. And that's the power of just a single book. One of the things that came up from the time that I was there and over the time in my early career is, is the real question is, how does the universe communicate with us? And we think that light is sort of this one way that the universe was communicating, but clearly only few percentage of the things in the universe emit light. So that cannot be the fundamental way the universe is trying to tell us about its own rules. And that brings back to this gentleman, uh, Albert Einstein, who about 100 years ago came up with a theory so revolutionary that it still sort of grapples human beings, you know, that how can a single brain come up with something so transformational by itself? And at the core of Einstein's theory is, I think, his this very childlike questions that he asks. So one of the questions that he used to call in German this Gedanken experiments, which is thought experiments. He asked this question that suppose, you know, Earth is going around the sun, it's a fact that we know for thousands of years, nothing new about it. But what if suppose the sun tomorrow is lifted away by aliens or by something? Let's say, suppose there is no Earth. So there is no sun, sorry. What happens to the trajectory of Earth? Does it still go around where it is going for you know, all these billions of years? And the answer is, it takes about eight minutes before we know that sun does not exist. For eight minutes, we would still be in the orbit around the sun. What that means is there is, even if you remove sun, there was something that was connecting us to the sun. And it is not this invisible space that we see between us and the sun, but there is actually a stage on which everything in the universe is put. And that stage is what this green mesh calls as a space-time uh, fabric. Now, this is a very evolved mathematical expression that he had come up with. In fact, just this weekend, I was for a couple of weeks in Bern, in Switzerland. I was chairing a conference. And in Bern is where Einstein had moved right after finishing college. It is a very inspiring story by itself that after graduating college, Einstein could not get a teaching job. And for two years, he actually kept asking for different universities and people to find him for a job. 
At the end, he got a assistant level position in the patent office as a clerk. And in Bern is where he used to work. And we, I visited his apartment, which is still preserved. It's called the Einstein House. And the story goes that he had like a newborn baby while he was at that apartment. He used to hold the baby, and in that sort of framework, he still derived the theory of relativity that we know of, and for which, and the photoelectric theory for which he won the Nobel Prize in physics. So, the core of Einstein's theory relies on having a four-dimensional ocean within which we are surrounded, which is called the space-time ocean. Sometimes it's called space-time fabric. And what happens is when you move the sun away, the fabric is responding to it. In fact, every time I'm moving here, or when you are moving everywhere in your day-to-day -day life, the fabric is actively responding to our motion. We as human beings don't have the perception that there is a space-time fabric around us that is responding to us. It's actually, a, we live in a four-dimensional universe. We don't live in a three-dimensional universe as this observer, this planetarium right now looks. And uh, Einstein had sort of come up with this key prediction that if gravity is the way that his theory behaves, then gravitational waves or these ripples in space-time is a given fact. It is a fact as solid as you know, the very nature of matter in the universe. Now the way this fabric interacts with us, so suppose if you move the sun away from Earth, one thing is Earth is no longer in the motion, but what would happen before that is that temporarily the whole Earth would stretch by some margin. And this stretch is not the fact that how we stretch because of the tidal waves from the moon pulling the oceans up and we see the tides. So it's not that kind of stretch. This is much more fundamental to us. This is like saying that if we are in this room and this entire room stretches, so much so that even if we had holden uh, any form of rulers, the ruler itself will stretch. There is no way to make a measurement out of it. Right? This, is, this is the core of what is called gravitational waves. Now Einstein came up with this beautiful theory, mathematically, etc., and he was convinced that this all is perfect mathematically, but we can't discover them. So there is no way that an uh, effect this illusion can be felt around us by experiments in any form. In fact, if you want to know how weak gravity is, let's say when I'm holding this pointer, my fingers have more force than the entire force of the Earth combined. Right? So only I need two fingers to counter the entire Earth. And that's one of the reasons why gravity is so weak. However, the whole universe definitely resides in this kind of a fabric. So the story of the discovery that I'm going to speak about had happened a couple of billion years ago. Uh, it was before even any form of uh, modern day life that we can think of, a sort of a cellular life had evolved on Earth. But about a couple of billion light years from Earth, in galaxy far, far away, there were two black holes that were coming closer and closer. They were in orbit for millions of years. When the two black holes came sufficiently close, they actually bumped into each other and formed a bigger black hole. This effect by itself, we can never see with light. In fact, the radius of each black hole, if the, if the mass of the black hole is about the mass of our sun, the radius is only about three kilometers. So if something is a billion light years away and itself has a radius of three kilometers, there is no way, no matter how powerful a telescope we can build, we can ever capture what this effect was. The masses were different here. Each black hole were about 30 times bigger than the size of the sun. And both of them then collided. The same image, however, if you were to see in in the four-dimensional space-time fabric, and here the dimensionality has been projected. So you see in two dimensions, the two black holes are going closer and closer, and they are emitting, you can call almost like sounds. And the reason I say it's sound is because there is a disturbance in the medium, right? The reason you hear my voice is because the atoms around us are sort of bumping into each other and finally reaching our eardrums. 
The same way the sound of the black hole started traveling across the universe. Every single star in the universe at least gets to hear once if two black holes collide. So that sound got emitted for billions of years. Finally, on this fateful Monday of September 14, 2015, which is in my lifetime the most interesting Monday that has ever happened, <laughs> uh, the waves came to Earth. I distinctly remember I was actually vacationing in Miami at the time, uh, the weekend before, and we were going to start you know, the campaign to hunt for this collisions of black holes. Um, and I knew that you know if there is any odds that we do find one, it is going to be much more stressful next semester of six months of fall. So I should rather take a vacation before we do. And right as soon as I landed, and uh, that morning we got an email that there has been waves that has actually come and hit the earth and momentarily, by momentarily I mean even less than a second, and this is key, it started stretching the whole earth. That means everyone in this room was present on planet earth, which I'm guessing everyone was, <laughs> on September 14th, you have felt a particular connection with the universe that your brain has not been trained to recognize but it has happened the waves actually did come to the earth and temporarily stretch i can actually restart this video so you can see the waves actually passing by you can see the sort of green blobs and the lighting is a little right here we can see the whole earth stretching this is of course an effect of the scale it did not stretch this much it was a very tiny stretch this is just so that people can appreciate what happened. Now, while the whole Earth was stretching, something particularly was stretching that was looking for it for a very, very long time. It is called LIGO. It stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, LIGO, this is a particular experiment funded by the National Science Foundation. It's a taxpayers funded project. This is the most expensive project ever funded, actually by you know, one of the federal agencies. This is a four kilometer arm, and another four kilometer arm. If for scale, this is what a car looks like when you are at the LIGO facility. This entire setup, four by four kilometer arm, was trying to look for this kind of a stretch that was happening in the universe. And that particular day, this particular detector, there is one detector in Louisiana, the other detector is in Washington, in the West Coast, and both of them at the same second responded to the stretch. Now the stretch itself is very, very tiny. In this four kilometer length, if you are asking how much did the whole LIGO facility stretched, so here is a comparison of a movie. Okay, yeah. So this is the diameter of a proton. Oh, sorry, it's an atom. And now we have zoomed in, and we are zooming in. That this is a level of proton. This is the diameter of the proton. And the stretch from the gravitational waves that came from the collision of black holes is this much. Now you can see how difficult it was to measure this. And that is a good reason why Einstein thought we would never be able to measure. Since 1970s, physicists, and one of them was my mentor's my PhD advisor, show of hands if you've seen Interstellar movie. Great. Interstellar was written by Professor Kip Thorne, he's my advisor, he's my academic grandfather. He is one of the founders of this experiment and received the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics, which makes him the only physicist to also have an Oscar-nominated film. Nobel Prize winning physicist. Um, I spent much of my PhD at this, uh, uh, semester of my PhD at this facility. Uh, this is me in the ultra high vacuum chambers, which will be somewhere here at the, at the adjacent site here. And it's very interesting, you know, because as a physicist, I got comfortable living in university labs where there would be a Starbucks that I can access within a five minute walk. But this is far from humanity, and for a good reason, because we are trying to find something which is so sacred in terms of measurement 
that anything, any disturbance, if there is a train passing by, it can stop your measurement. If there is an earthquake that happens in Australia, the waves would eventually reach the coast of Louisiana and you won't be able to measure the gravitational waves that I just mentioned. So this has to be a very remote facility. In fact, one of the most uh, patience that you need at the facility is when you are driving from here to go to the mirror on the other side and the maximum speed is five miles per hour. <laughs> because otherwise that would disturb you know, the mirrors inside it. And we would also have a very interesting take. So if in case a trucker comes in the facility uh, by mistake, then we would have to fully shut down the whole facility for a couple of hours. So this by itself was looking for gravitational waves. Uh, it took about 10 years to build this facility. It started constructing in the 90s. Since 2000, it was trying to look for gravitational waves. And only in 2015, Finally, we reached the sensitivity where we could make an experiment. So talk about if you don't get the correct measurements in your physics lab, this is a 15 year wait to get a right measurement, right? The signal, now here comes the part why this is listening. So as I mentioned, right, this are the way, this is that we are in a medium. Imagine if you're within an ocean and a fish is flapping, right? So the waves eventually come, but the way you can interpret these waves is a form of a sound, right? It's a disturbance of the medium, which is exactly what sound is. If you could hear the gravitational waves that the two LIGO detectors have recorded, it will sound something like this. It does sound a little scary, but it doesn't look that scary. Um, it would make a nice, actually, Halloween. So this, are the, uh, this is uh, the incoming gravitational waves that was recorded by the LIGO detectors on September 14, 2015. These are two independent detectors. Both measured a wave that looks exactly identical to a very high precision, actually. And when I first saw the signal on September 14, just based on the morphology of the signal, we know that it comes from the collision of two black holes. Tomorrow I'm giving the physics and astronomy colloquium where I'll go into more detail about this. But this particular signal is as good a measurement as taking pictures of black holes. The sound, this particular wave that has come, has come from the very boundaries of black hole, which we call event horizon. Anything within event horizon is where no force in the universe can escape. So once you're inside the event horizon, there is no information the outside universe has. This wavelet has come from right from the edges of event horizon. Right? So we know for this is a very confirmed uh, measurement of what has happened here. There are three ripples that happened right after discovery. And we wrote a couple of papers, all secret. And here Professor Mili will tell you how badly kept secret this was. But it was still secret to me. And I did not share it with my immediate family until the day of the gravitational wave discovery was released. In fact, one of the points we made, which is a thing about modern science, is that when you make a discovery, you just don't go out, make a press release, and tell the public. You publish papers. You let the peer review committee tell you how wrong your result is. You argue with them. You prove you are right. Finally, the paper is published. It did not happen that way. It generally does happen. So we did not publish the results for almost five to six months until we were convinced that what we had seen is actually gravitational waves. Just from the signal that I showed you, we were able to prove that yes, black holes exist precisely as Einstein's theory had predicted. The picture of the black hole that many of, many of you have seen came much later and actually it still does not prove that black hole exists with the same level of accuracy as the signal. It also proves something fundamental that gravitational waves exist. And I want to get back to that first picture I told you about, you know, this beautiful galaxies that we see from ultra, from the James Webb Space Telescope. All that information was light waves, electromagnetic waves. And we were only looking at 1% of the universe that can emit that light. And now we know that there is a separate sixth sense, so to speak, that we now possess to understand the universe, which is gravitational waves. And also, 
something related to astronomy was that the collision of black holes existed, which is very dear to my research, because collisions of black holes are the building blocks of the universe in many ways. The very fact that we are in a galaxy right now, our galaxy has a heart, which is a big black hole, which is four million times bigger than our sun. How did that black hole come into existence? And that's why collisions of black holes are very crucial to know how the universe is the way it is. The collision that I showed you, you see, when we talk about energy, we are so used to thinking of energy only in electromagnetic way. This light is hitting me, and I can already feel a little warmth. And that warmth means that there is an energy from photons that is coming to me. The same way we feel the warmth of the sun every rare mornings like today when it is sunny at this time of the year, so we feel that there is a nice warmth. But in gravitational waves, the energy emitted from a system is so much more that one collision of black hole, just one, emits more energy than all the stars in the universe combined at that moment. Just think that in. If we use a formula, the famous formula of Einstein, E is equal to mc square, which has dictated much of the human geopolitics in the last century, um, that formula, if you use for collision of two black hole, it emits more light, more energy than anything that we know in the universe at the point. So this was a good sort of a birthday cake for Einstein after 100 years since he made the discovery. We actually asked Google to make the doodle that day, but they didn't. Now, I, when we were going to announce the discovery, which was on February 11th, uh, 2016, is a particularly very important day for all of us who were part of this discovery. I have been perpetually a cynic person, so I thought no one is going to care about the gravitational wave discovery. I was like, why would someone, I mean, to me, it was the greatest thing that has ever happened. Uh, to science, maybe, to physics, definitely, but to the rest of the public, this is not like finding water on Mars. Right? This is not like finding alien life. So this is still a subtle discovery, right? Although it has this huge ramification, and I was so happily proved wrong. The next day after the day when we actually announced the gravitational wave discovery from Washington, D.C., the first one to congratulate us was at the time the president of the United States, President Obama, sent a tweet, and it had a nice line that said Einstein was right. And actually, Einstein was right about gravitational waves. It was the headlines of every newspaper in the world on February 12th, and the New York Times had this nice picture of the LIGO detector with my colleagues. Now, I come from a part of India where it, we already speak uh, you know, multiple languages, but the language that I speak, we rarely or almost never had any coverage of science in newspapers. I had never grown up reading any scientific stories in my newspaper. And to my surprise, in our local language, they had the headlines that gravitational wave discovery happened. They actually found the word gravitational wave is what the equivalent is in my language. And they also found a picture of me from my freshman years, which was very embarrassing. <laughs> so since then, I've I've told all students that maintain a good website with a picture. So whenever there is a discovery, the press knows what to, how to look. <laughs> the, the larger effects of the discovery did go much beyond, of course, that anyone of us had uh, predicted. So in just a couple of weeks, the Prime Minister of India was here in the United States visiting President Obama. And at the time, he invited myself and my colleagues explain to him the gravitational wave discovery. And the third LIGO detector, like the one that we do have in, in the US, the third one is being built in India. Right? So that is the, this is the actually the highest scientific partnership between the United States and India. And one of the joys that I have as a scientist is that I was able to speak about the gravitational wave discovery in my own native language to the leader of my country. Right? And that those are the moments that we know that the science that we do in the lab, most part it feels like a very aloof process, um, rarely seeing, you know, not knowing what some future is in academic career itself, but uh, these are the moments that indicate like, yes, 
living files as a method. Now, when I was much younger, actually, when I was in my undergrad, we had one of this kind of lectures at the place that I had in undergrad. And uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners actually came to give a talk. And at the time, I was deciding where to go for my graduate school. I had a couple of admissions, and I wanted, I was not sure. And this is many years before the discovery of gravitational waves. And the field was so looped down that there is no way we can detect gravitational waves. That was a broad consensus. Actually, every 10 years, the National Academies does a sort of a, a survey of what is the important science that the United States has to do. And uh, because we had not discovered gravitational waves until then, it was sort of you know, put so down in the priority list they did not look like a sort of a tangible academic career. And there's this quote that the Nobel laureate, when I asked him after this kind of a lecture, and he said, and something that stuck to me very well, that finding gravitational waves is like finding aliens. But sure, they do exist, but it's not that as if we are going to find it, because the very act of measurement is so impossible. But I'm also a fan of Rick and Morty. Um, and there is this quote from Rick and Morty that I think is like, I mean, it's outside my office door, the professor, that to live is to risk it all. Otherwise, you are just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting wherever the universe goes. And five years after the gravitational wave discovery, this are the amount of gravitational waves we have detected. Since September 2015, we have detected 90 gravitational waves every single one confirming Einstein's theory of relativity, every single one of them confirming that gravitational waves existing. Between this 90 has changed, made a paradigm shift of how we look at the universe. This is same as saying if Galileo had his first telescope and looked at Jupiter and found that Jupiter had moons, and after that he started pointing everywhere else and would be completely amazed what the universe offers. This all is the gravitational wave discovery. And in fact, one of the transition is that when I was a graduate student, we had only three gravitational wave discoveries. And I was so happy that in my PhD thesis, I had like three names to remember of gravitational wave discoveries that happened. When I was a postdoc, we had 10 more discoveries. And I was like, wow, this is like the greatest thing ever. And by the time I became faculty, there are just so many gravitational wave discoveries that I don't recall and I have to remember ask my students to tell me which one we are speaking of, right? Which is saying that there is a birth of a field. This picture of 90 gravitational wave discoveries was NASA's astronomy picture of the day. It was done with one of graduate students in Ocean Gomia when I was at Georgia Tech. But I really like to see, because each one of them is sounds. Each one of them is a discovery related to black hole in some sense. And every one of them is unique. This is same as if we had started taking the genealogy of the DNA that we see around us and find interesting discoveries about our own origins, the same kind of things that we see from the black hole discoveries. One particular, however, I'll quickly mention, is the discovery that happened in August of 2017, in which case not only did gravitational waves come, and this one came from the collision of two neutron stars, not black holes. Neutron stars are what stars make when they are not as puffy as you know, the bigger stars. So our sun would never make a black hole or a neutron star. It would only make a white dwarf. Neutron star is another kind of a heavy dense matter. There are the two collision of neutron stars that happen. And that collision of neutron stars created gravitational waves just like how we see the gravitational wave from the collision of two black holes. Fine, routine discovery for us by now. However, at that very second, a NASA satellite actually found a signal coming from a particular region in the sky that exactly matched where the gravitational wave discovery came from. And that created collision of the two neutron star created what we call a kilonova. It is separate from supernova because the kilonova is actually associated with how heavy elements in this universe are made. This is one of our supercomputer simulations. Uh, you can see the collision of two neutron stars. And right after that, how the matter around the neutron star has sort of you know, completely shredded things apart. Now, to me, this is a, the most fundamental scientific discovery that I've been part of. 
even bigger than the discovery of gravitational waves in some sense. It's because it lies to this very question, the fundamental question, you know, what is the purpose of ourselves in the universe? These are all the periodic table elements that we have been seeing since, of course, middle school. Colors represent how these elements were formed in the universe. We see gold. We take a lot of pride by owning gold rings, gold coins, etc., as dictated in human civilization to wars, etc. But where did gold come from? We find gold from Earth, but how did Earth get gold to begin with? Or sun has, maybe, but then how did the sun get it? In fact, there is no process in our own Milky Way galaxy that would have created by itself the gold that we see other than uh, the merger of the two neutron stars that I just showed. So we saw the image in, in gravitational waves, but the same image after the merger, what happens to the two collision neutron stars is still a no way. It shreds this amount of gold and heavy elements in the universe. And that's also the same reason why something like uranium is actually created. Mergers of neutron stars is the reason why intelligent life can survive. We do not think intelligent life can sustain. By intelligent life, I mean something that can become a space-faring civilization without having access to gold to make the transistors, without having access to something like uranium to make nuclear power possible. There is no way that can intelligent life exist. And mergers of neutron stars, the discovery that we made in 2017, is actually what leads us to that. Right? So it's a very humbling thing to know how much we are connected to processes that have happened beyond even the time scale in which humans have walked on Earth, and that will still dictate us every single day. The third discovery that I was very much waiting for and uh, played a key role was the discovery of certain kinds of black holes. You know, the black holes collide, the collision of black holes create uh, gravitational waves, and we can know exactly what is the how big those black holes were when they collide. Now, there are certain sizes of black holes that stars absolutely cannot make. I won't go into much detail of it because tomorrow's colloquium, I'm going to speak about it. But finally, we made that discovery in uh, May. It happened two days, actually, after my birthday. So I'll take that as a late present from the universe. Um, it took us a long time to be sure what we are seeing is gravitational waves from this kind of black holes, not to measure, mention that there was a global pandemic while we were going through the scientific discoveries. And this is the headlines of New York Times science page the day we made the discoveries that this black hole shouldn't exist, but then they are. And uh, that very day, the BBC actually interviewed me for speaking about the discovery. And I was very humbled that they actually played a clip from Professor Stephen Hawking to introduce me. I was going to play that clip very quickly. It's tedious bits of journalistic shorthand is to talk about shockwaves rippling around the world. Well, we're going to hear now about a shockwave that's ripped through the cosmos and may lead to a fresh understanding of how the universe functions. Scientists are very excited uh, about the detection of the biggest merger yet between two black holes. How big? Well, big enough for the signal to travel for seven billion years before it rattled laser detectors in the US and Italy last year. And as for black holes, here's a quick reminder. Black holes are formed by the collapse of massive stars when they have exhausted their nuclear fuel. can no longer support themselves against their own gravity. They are quite literally holes in space that stuff can fall into, but not get out of. They are places where the gravitational field is so strong that nothing, not even light, can get away. The unmistakable voice of uh, Stephen Hawking speaking uh, as part of a BBC documentary in 2018. 
Karan Jani is one of the lead authors of the scientific paper published today, which gave us details of this discovery. He's an astrophysicist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. We detected a collision of two black holes in the universe when the uh, universe was just about half its current age, so from really, really far away. It created a black hole, which is the most massive and the most unknown type of black hole we had ever seen. It completely puzzles us. Why does it completely puzzle you? I'm not going to show the whole interview, but uh, the to me there has been this humbling connection that I would not have been doing physics if I had not come across The Brief History of Time book by Stephen Hawking. And when we did make the discovery of gravitational waves, we were, the team was awarded by myself, was the special breakthrough prize in physics. And that was awarded by the previous recipient of that prize, which was Sir Stephen Hawking. And uh, to sort of feel that we are able to continue the legacy of you know, finding black holes, finding legacy of such a great man, is definitely one of the things that that I'm very aware of that legacy that I'm continuing. Now, I've already given to you what we are doing now. I'm gonna give you a quick snapshot of what the next 20 years of my field are going to look like. So now that we know gravitational waves exist, our next step is to build a gravitational wave observatory in the space, something that I and my colleagues at Vanderbilt are very much involved with. And the process is the same, that we want to build a large interferometer in sky. So we are expected to launch in 2034. It is a European Space Agency mission, which will be launching three satellites in space. And that three satellites by itself would make what you would call a giant LIGO in space. The mission is actually called LISA, stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. It's a handful of words. But what you can see is instead of L shape, we have a triangle. The triangle geometry is because you know, it's easier to maintain that in the space versus you know, making an L shape. The size of this instrument is so grand that nothing that we have as a humanity created as a machine is bigger than what's going to be the laser interferometer space antenna. Here is sun in comparison to the detector. So you can get a scale of how big are we talking about big. It is about uh, two and a half million kilometer distance. The, and it is going to travel uh, Earth behind, and it's going to actually go around the sun. Most space telescopes we make either are orbiting the Earth, or they are at L2, which is a point connecting, you know, like zero gravity. Um, net happens, so not zero gravity, it's net cancellation happens um, when the James Webb Space Telescope is. This is what the LISA space mission is going to be. And this is something I'm super excited about uh, in terms of what we can find. Now beyond that, a pet project that I'm with heavily involved is to build a gravitational wave detector just like how we have on Earth, and actually on the moon. And this would not have been happening if NASA was not returning back to the moon after 50 years. In fact, when the last time NASA did go to the moon, the astronauts with, carried with them a gravity meter, which was supposed to be a sort of a primitive version of a gravitational wave detector. Too bad the instrument did not work, and then we use that as a seismometer to know whether we can actually get gravitational waves from the moon. But the moon happens to be one of the best places in solar system where we can conduct a gravitational wave observatory. And I'm happy to chat about that uh, later as well. The future of gravitational waves is just the way the future of electromagnetic astronomy was. You know, we had Galileo make a visible light telescope. After that, we made bigger telescopes to capture more light, then we realize that, well, we can also make X-ray telescopes, we can make infrared telescopes, we can make UV telescopes, but they all are fundamentally electromagnetic waves that we are trying to find. It's a spectrum that we look at the universe. The same way, right now, LIGO detects gravitational waves that are generally of the size of milliseconds. Space missions will start looking at gravitational waves with periods of a couple of hours. So these are sounds that would be stretching a couple of seconds to a couple of hours, right? This is how you can perceive them. Eventually, moon will be somewhere in between, and then we have plans all the way to go to find the very sound that was created when the universe was born. We see cosmic microwave background 
but that happens a couple of hundred thousand years after the universe was born. So we lose certain information. But gravitational waves was there in the universe as soon as the universe was born, because gravitational waves is space and time, and anything that is born has space and time, because it's progressing. So we get to hear the very sounds of the early universe. Last minute, I'm just going to say, because I do get this asked in public lectures often. This is all pretty cool. Gravitational waves is considered the greatest scientific discovery of the century. It is absolutely in the same level as landing on the moon in terms of how it impacts human, uh, as a sort of a scale of what humanity has achieved. But how does it help day to day? It's a very tricky question. But Einstein did not create general theory of relativity so that we can drive from here to restaurant and know exactly the direction of it. The GPS technology that actually helps us you know, navigate pretty much functioning humans day to day morning, humans require GPS, is the only direct applications of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Because the very watch that the satellite has and the watch that you have think in a very different way. And it's hard to know, you know, I mean, a hundred years ago for Einstein, you know, the theory had its application. In the same way, it is hard to know if gravitational waves, you know, hundred years down the line, how it is going to have help human human race. But one way I do think is that if we are going to become a space-faring civilization, then just using Newton's laws of physics is not enough. No matter how you construct a satellite, no matter how big a rocket that Musk would build, it is not going to leave solar system. We do not have an understanding of how space and time actually interacts with us just based on this almost now primitive understanding of gravity that we use to build rockets, etc. And while I'm not a fan of time travel and wormholes and time reps, etc., I do think that our understanding of actually as a human race leaving our solar system very fundamentally relies on finding a theory beyond Einstein's general theory of relativity. Einstein's theory is the most successful human expression mathematically that nature obeys so far. Other than that in quantum mechanics, we don't know anything that human brain has come up with that the nature is in so much agreement with. However, we do know Einstein's theory cannot fully explain black holes. At the heart of black holes are singularity where all known laws of physics break down. And that's not a comfortable truth to live with, especially as a scientist who's studying black holes. So the hope is that maybe not now, a couple of hundred years, just like how Einstein came and came with GPS, in a hundred years, gravitational waves would have a direct impact on how we live. So on that note, thank you. and I'll run over to you with the microphone so everybody can hear it. So how do these gravitational wave observatories achieve the kind of precision that you need to detect gravitational waves? If I recall, you mentioned that it was on the order of, I think, four times 10 to the negative 18th meters. Yeah. How would you ever detect that, especially in a four kilometer long tunnel? That's a very good question. Man. We needed a lot of uh, optical techniques to be able to actually keep light bouncing between the two. The thing that we measure is actually not really the change in path length. But if you've heard of uh, interfer like Michelson interferometer, when the two lights meet, and if they have traveled the same distance, lights actually identically cancel in if they are in phase. So the experiment would have a bright fringe or a dark fringe, depending on how you create it. So we look for the change in fringes. So if a dark fringe becomes a bright fringe, we know that something has changed by a certain amount. And that we have improved the precision of how well we can measure the change in fringe. We don't really have a ruler to measure full kilometer change. So I, so I have a lot of questions, and I don't want to 
uh, monopolize, but um, your runs zero, one, two, and three found the collisions of black holes and then um, black hole and neutron star, or neutron stars, then a black hole and a neutron star. Yes. Am I mistaken in thinking that run four will start sometime next year? Yes, it starts in March 2023. What could you possibly be expecting to see? I have a few bets that I have placed with my colleagues, but one of the things that we have not seen yet, and we may get lucky in the fourth observing run, is we have not seen new, uh, gravitational waves from a standalone object. So if a neutron star has a few tiny mountains around it, and then the neutron star is constantly spinning, it is actually spinning the whole space time, and that kind of a continuous gravitational waves not a burst like this, but continues no matter when we see, it's always there. I think that would be a big discovery. The, um, if I'm not correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, but don't the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light? That is our best measurement. And, are, uh, we, are, we, are we still looking for something called graviton? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Then they would have to be massless, correct? Well, the current limit that we put on their mass is already so tiny that most theories predicting graviton mass has started becoming shaky. I'm so, sorry, read that. So the mass of graviton that we are measuring is already so small that any theory that was predicting mass, massive gravitons are already being eliminated. So it would be very likely that gravitons could be massless, which would be a kind of a bummer. How could you possibly find the way to detect the gravitons if they're massless? No, we, we see the propagation of, I mean, the best case is uh, something like this, when a light has come from an event and gravitational waves has also come from the event. So we both know how fast something is traveling, and then we can compare. Got it, got it. That, that's standing similar to a pulsar? Yes, that's, that's a pulsar, the rotating neutron star, yes. And rotating pulsars are one of the sources of gravitational waves. So one of your com uh, uh, comments made me thinking about, you said uh, we can use uh, E equals MC squared to kind of understand the amount of energy that uh, the neutron to black holes collision would emit at that given instant. So I was thinking maybe like uh, trying to understand it, that means you knew the mass difference and you put that mass difference. Yes. And how do you get the mass difference by looking at the radius at the beginning and the end? Yes. We do, you have, do you have that information? Yes, we look at gravitational waves uh, both before and after collision of the two black holes. So I can not have the sound, but okay. So the waves that come from this patch versus the waves that come from this patch. So this is when a black hole has already collided and become one. And this is when the two black holes are separated. And so we know the measurement of masses here, and we know the measurement of masses here. And that's how we actually know the difference. That's one way we know how the difference is. Thank you. Uh, from what we see on the screen here, you uh, you have two detectors. Uh, one detects it, and the other one, I mean, well, they both confirm each other. For the one in space, you just have the one. So is there going to be something similar? It's actually six, because it's a triangle. So each arm, it's actually three, sorry. We could have one. L, one triangle, other triangle, and the third triangle. So the geometry is actually three detectors together. And that's why triangle geometry is the one that we are trying to make on the Earth, the next one, which is called Einstein Telescope, which is either going to be in Italy or Netherlands, where uh, both the countries are, uh, are actually bidding to get that. Uh, it is going to be a triangle LIGO detector inside Earth, inside underground. And the triangle being because we can use each of them, each of our combination as a separate interferometer. Okay, so I actually have two questions. 
The first one being, you mentioned the Lisa project. How are you guys planning on prototyping it or testing it before you guys send it off to space? Which it has been already been tested. It's called the Lisa Pathfinder mission. Um, that was one of the big technology gap that needed to be shown because constructing a space mission, other than spending 15 plus years of many human life, human beings time, also cost a couple of billion dollars. And one of the biggest tests that has never happened is whether we can do interferometry in space. And LISA Pathfinder that was launched uh, on the same time as the Tycho Wave Adaptation Wave Discovery was able to show that. All right, and then the second question was, so towards the end you mentioned like going to space and becoming like spacefaring. So from your perspective or your expertise, do you think it is possible to move to space one day or what are yeah. your like opinions on it? Well, I absolutely think that I do imagine that in my lifetime I'm going to have coffee while looking at sunset on Mars. And if in my lifetime it can happen, then in the next lifetime maybe it can be um, at one of the moons of Jupiter, or Saturn, sorry, uh, and be able to do the same. And so it is inevitable that we as human race cannot be on this planet forever. Uh, so. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that growing up like in India, you had very little access to like science like in your native language um, And now you've um, shared the breakthrough prize in physics um, What would you say was one thing that really helped um, your rise to becoming a scientist? I think deep down for me doing science is a very philosophical, spiritual expedition, right? I do it completely out of my own selfish interest to learn the universe. Um, and that has just not ever changed. Like, I genuinely wanna, I feel very scared as a human being that I don't know so much about the universe. Like, I don't know my own answers. And so for me to do science is a way to, of course, ask my own questions. And uh, that has been at least how I look at it. But at the same time, I'm also aware that uh, I think I had been on right time at right places that has made me lucky enough to be a scientist when all don't have that same privilege. And uh, I hope that that kind of thing I can broaden you know, over the time. The uh, big fascination with uh, black holes over the last several years has been uh, the singularity of what may exist on the other side of a black hole, if anything. Do you believe that with astronomy in its current state, we would eventually be able to figure that out? And what are some uh, hypotheses that you feel may be uh, most convincing on what we know? Well, that's a great question. I don't know if just by the current level of, I wouldn't say technology, because gravitational wave itself is a very big technological leap for us to study black holes. But the very mathematical formulation of how does, so for example, I can give you a simple example. Let's say if a star becomes a black hole, it has one singularity at the center of it. But if a black hole is formed out of collision of two black holes, which has two singularities individually, and now they are colliding, of course those singularities eventually also merge. That kind of mathematical information is very difficult to pass right now. We are able to do certain level of simulations to see how the singularities behave. It's not well understood right now. We don't have the mathematical formalism to properly understand singularity. What could be the case is that it is not a classical black hole, but it's a quantum black hole, which should be the case conceptually. There has to be quantum physics involved at the level of singularity somehow. And it is able to prevent a known singularity the way we think. Something else is there. Um, that kind of what something else is there, I don't know if it is a question we can answer in a, in a finite time. Hope that helps. Uh, in the BBC clip that you pay, uh, played, there was a reference to it had been traveling, those particular ways have been traveling for several billion years. So yes. what is the mechanism for determining uh, time? In, yes. in these and, and how long these have been traveling and what yes. is there a directional factor to it? Yes, very much so. This is very much like we do astronomy where in, uh, let's say for an example, how do we know 
in the picture of uh, James Webb Space Telescope that the galaxy is very far. So we look for something called red shifting of lines. The same kind of things we can able to do here as well. Right? The very lines that we are seeing here, if you had a sort of a standard map, right, that, that says this is a collision of this kind of black holes, then just based on the amplitude and the stretch that has happened because of the expansion of the universe, you can know how far something has come from. So we do, uh, we are able to do the standard astronomy distance calculation uh, with gravitational waves. Uh, where would you place the observation of on the moon, the light side or the dark side? And second question, did you go to school in India? Yes, I did go to, I studied in a government school in India. Which one? In uh, Gujarat. Uh, I, I know, in, but uh, where? In, uh, <laughs> in Baroda. Oh, not in Rajkot? Not in Rajkot. In the outskirts of Baroda, there's the boy. That's where I went to school. And I studied at MS University in Baroda before moving. Now on the moon, it doesn't actually matter to us where we put on the moon. A uh, gravitational wave interacts to the front side of the moon and the back side of the moon practically the same way. But it does matter where NASA builds a base on the moon. Because if there is more geopolitical reasons to build something facing the Earth, then we build an observatory there. If there are more reasons to build something on the far side, because we already know um, other countries have probes on the far side, and if that is the ambition to build a base, then yes. So either ways for gravitational wave astronomy does not matter. I have two questions. A, is it known whether or not gravitational waves can be lensed or interfered with either A, by yes. other gravitational waves, or, I thought about gravitational lensing occurring but with supermassive black holes and galaxies. Is it possible that they can be bent or refracted in some way? That's a beautiful question. Yes, yes, it can lens. It behaves just like light does, but very difficult to measure right now. So the fact that when we see something has come from a billion light years away, that means the billion light years it was traveling, there were these galaxies and structures of galaxies which it was interacting with. So it has to bend. But the change in bending coefficient is so tiny right now. It is there. It is there in the signal. Our detectors are not good enough. And maybe when we go to the space, the LISA mission would have the technical word is signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio of bending of gravitational waves has to be higher, and LISA can probably see that. Uh, so how you said like the gravitational waves can hit the Earth, do those waves have any like negative effects in any way? No, it's uh, actually one of the uh, problems I give in my graduate class that if collision of two black holes happen at the edge of solar system, can humanity survive? And the answer is yes, it can actually sustain because the impact of gravitational waves, even if it's such a highly energetic event, it cannot break the bonds, the electromagnetic bonds that are there. And so, I mean, we would know a gravitational wave has passed by, and it would have other serious effects, uh, like a black hole coming towards us. Um, but um, the waves by itself would not have. So by and large, the whole biological evolution has had no impact of gravitational waves coming from cosmos. You started out by talking about the dark matter and dark energy and didn't come back to that. So I'm wondering how or how much do the gravitational waves um, tell us about the dark matter and dark energy? Yeah, and I apologize on not mentioning on that part, but there are two things we were able to do. When we, were, we measured the light and gravitational waves from the same event, we were able to independently tell how much the universe has expanded from this instance when the light came to the point it arrived. So that is measured as Hubble's constant. Now there is this big debate on you know, whether the Hubble constant is, what is the exact value of it? Because two different techniques don't agree. Gravitational waves offers us a third independent way to measure how much the universe has expanded. 
how much the universe has expanded it tells us something about the nature of dark energy. That's one. The case of dark matter is this the black holes that I mentioned that you know have formed in ways that we don't estimate stars to have formed could mean that there is a primordial population of black holes that had formed very early in the universe. And what we are seeing is some sort of a tail distribution of the black holes. Those black holes may not have been formed. Uh, I mean, so we don't know if any of the black holes that LIGO see are periodic matters. And we assume they are made out of regular stars stuff, but we don't know if there is a separate function to make them. And that's one way we are able to probe dark matter in the universe. Uh, sorry if my question isn't very scientific sounding, but when stuff gets sucked into black holes, uh, what do we know about what happens to it? And uh, if we don't know, what research is being done to find out? <laughs> no, we don't know what happens when something gets sucked into black holes. We see light of gas, we see gas around black holes very often, and we see how the gas is interacting with the event horizon. I don't have the pretty picture of the event horizon team, but they took a picture of one of the galaxies, also our center of our own galaxy. You can see how the light is bending from gas that is accreting around the black hole. What we don't know what happens, of course, when it goes inside. Um, I mean, one simple thing is we know it grows in size. Right? So if you put 10 kilograms, the black hole generally gains about 9 kilograms. If you kilogram it, drive it away. Uh, because of radiation or something. But it does grow in size because of gas. In fact, a lot of early black holes must have grown because of gas being accreted on it. So that happens. Um, but specifically, I don't know what would happen to the object in it. Any more questions? you mentioned that the gravitational wave gives you a different value or a new value to Hubble's constant, did it confirm either of the other two methods? Or is it it's yet still a third? Too broad. I'm sorry? It's still too broad, the Hubble constant error bar. One of the things which I have been working on is if the universe has a certain way to not make stars beyond a particular size, or black holes, sorry, beyond a particular size. And that limit is around 50 solar mass. So what happens is, if you start seeing black holes that are bigger than 50 solar mass, the way we are very much inferring the mass of the black hole assumes a certain cosmology in it. Because we need to know how much the waves have stretched. And so if we reverse the logic and say that there is a known astrophysical population and yet we always see a more massive black hole. That means we can start learning something about the Hubble's constant independently, just from what the, the composition of black holes are. And that is, uh, that is something we are doing. It's just like right now, the field is still at its infancy. So the way I see LIGO is the same way as COBE was for cosmic microwave background. The goal of LIGO was that gravitational waves existed. Exist. I think it would require next generation instruments to measure Hubble constant well enough. The only way a black hole can form this massive star collapse is not a medium star or a small star. Yes, that is correct. Or that is. Or sun is a medium star, I say. Or sun, it would create, yes, only a white dwarf. Just massive. Just massive stars, which are also rare. And uh, that's why. We don't have too many black holes. But a fun fact that I'll leave you all with is that the sounds that we just heard, every 15 minutes or so, a sound like this actually comes to Earth. And it hits all of us, every single one of us in this room. And uh, that's just a fact that we can live peacefully with. Let's thank uh, our speaker. Uh, and thank you very much. And I heard you say that um, you weren't a fan of wormholes. Um, why? And how much do we scientifically know about them? 
So one of my colleague actually did that. Like if you had collision of two wormholes, what kind of gravitational waves it would emit? And actually, all the way up till the merger, it looks exactly the same. It's just that the collision of two black holes creates a black hole, which is very specific. Collision of two wormholes creates something which does not have the same structure. It's a nice thing to search for. I don't deny it, but um, I don't know if there is a natural mechanism in, I would say, let's say, the number of ways universe knows how to make black hole is so much more than the number of ways universe knows how to make black holes. And that's why it is more likely what we see is a collision of black holes. But yeah, I'm not a fan of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>